Well, good morning. Uh, it's good to be able to uh, bring God's word and look at it together as a fellowship. Uh, we're going to be, as Bernie said, back in Philippians chapter two this morning. We've had a bit of a detour uh, from that. We were last here in Philippians chapter two, uh, back at the very start of December. And uh, since then, really, uh, through the, the Christmas period and through our month of prayer, in some ways, what we've done is we've done a sort of extended sort of tangent of the themes that Paul picks up here in Philippians chapter two. Um, we thought, didn't we, over Christmas period, as we tend to do anyway, uh, about the birth and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, which, you know, as Paul points out in this chapter here, is a mark of the humility of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and then uh, through the last month, uh, during our month of prayer, we thought about serving. And again, Paul here in this chapter calls the church to serve, to uh, serve one another, to serve God, to consider each other's needs. And in doing so, model the Lord Jesus Christ whose humility he sets before them. Uh, so uh, though I had wondered whether we'd go back and look a bit more about particularly from verses 5 uh, to 11 here in chapter 2, um, and there's lots more we could dig into that, I think it's helpful for us to just to move on uh, through this letter. So we're just going to read uh, from Philippians chapter 2 and verse 9, so that's part way through Paul's description of who Jesus is. So Philippians 2 verse 9, uh, Paul writes this under the hand of God. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God, without fault in a warped and crooked generation, then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I'll be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you, too, should be glad and rejoice with me. Paul, <clears throat> here in these verses, particularly from verse uh, five, uh, 12 down to 18, as we just read, uh, is moving on to deal with another aspect of Christian living that the people in Philippi needed to hear. Uh, now, I don't know about you, uh, but there are several themes that seem to just keep cropping up in the New Testament and uh, whether your heart at sometimes sinks when you read it again or whether you just go oh I know this uh, it depends as to perhaps the way we uh, view it uh, but I think uh, what Paul is dealing with here is so frequently occurring in the New Testament because it's such a vital aspect to mark of what it means to be a Christian. Uh, how do we know that Paul is dealing with it, with what it means to live as a Christian? Well, cast your eyes back to chapter one, uh, verse 27. Uh, Paul there says to the church in Philippi, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. He, he, he's saying to them, you are going to have to live in the right way. And he's started to cover that here in chapter two. He talked about their unity, their servanthood, their um, uh, submission uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he's painted this wonderful picture of who the Lord Jesus is uh, and says to them, no, here's, here's the reason why. Here's the model for you to go on. And now he moves on to look at this topic that we, we call uh, doctrinally uh, sanctification. And what that means is uh, the process of being made holy, the process of being transformed more into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. The moment we become Christians, 
uh, we are saved. God declares us as righteous for all of eternity. Uh, but in our own human experience, uh, we know that we're not perfect, don't we? Uh, we know we stumble into sin. We, we struggle each day. It's a daily battle against temptation. And at times we feel it more painfully drawing on us than we would like. And Paul says to them, this is what's needed. This is what has to be there. Why? Because it's another visible sign of the power of the gospel at work in God's people. And I take comfort from the fact that this is a theme that is so frequently mentioned in the New Testament. Why? Because it shows that the struggle that the early Christians had, the struggles that even Paul himself had, uh, are, are not uncommon. And that when I experience them, when you experience the struggle against your own sin and the temptations in this world around us, uh, we're not alone in that. Uh, but yet, just as those in the New Testament and Paul knew the power and the help and the strength of the spirit to do so, to, to live a holier life, to, to walk more closely after Jesus, so also can we. And so uh, there are uh, three headings for us this morning as we think about what it is to be uh, sanctified, to be made more like Jesus. And the first thing we need to consider is that it is an act of duty, an act of duty. Uh, Paul begins, doesn't he, in verse 12 by saying, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue. So you, you, you've always sought to obey what I've said to you. You've always sought to do what is good and right and honouring before the Lord. And says, continue it. You've done it when I'm in your presence. Continue it now when I'm absent. Even more so. You know, but now much more. Um, that's a real challenge and test, isn't it? Um, there are times, aren't there, where as a parent, you might ask your child to do something and you know that as long as you're standing in the room over them, uh, keeping an eye on them, they will do exactly what you've said. Uh, but there's a concern that the moment you walk out the room, perhaps they'll start finding a book to read or a toy to play with or something else to do. Uh, and, and Paul is conscious of this. He's conscious that we work and we find it easier uh, to live as Christians when there is someone keeping an eye on us, perhaps that's something you found a struggle with at present. Uh, as we've all become a bit more isolated, as we've had no, less contact time with one another, less of an influence and a bearing on one another, uh, we can perhaps find it easier to slip into ways that we know aren't right and aren't honouring to the Lord. But yet we kind of find it almost easier just to do it. Uh, and, and that's one of the joys, isn't it? And the blessings of joining together, of spending time with one another. Uh, I've been using a little bit for some devotional thoughts uh, this year, a, a new book to me at least, uh, by a pastor in America called Paul Tripp. Uh, it's entitled New Morning Mercies. I, if you're wanting something as just a devotional, helpful thought, it's good. If you're wanting something to help you study the Bible, it's not necessarily the one for you. Uh, but in just the devotion that he has, I read this morning earlier on, uh, he was arguing and saying that one of the joys and the benefits of corporate worship of a church gathering together is that we are reminded on a weekly basis we're not the people we yet should be. And that as human and humanity as a whole, we're very good at trying to justify who we are. Maybe that's something that we've been missing in our times together, uh, missing that rush with the reality of the spiritual truths of the word of God. And that's hopefully uh, what we are confronted with when we are at least able to join in uh, in this format and manner on Sundays at present. Paul says, obey, obey this. And what are they to obey? Well, he calls them to work out their salvation. Uh, he doesn't say work on your salvation. Uh, he says work out. He's not meaning here you need to develop your salvation, the stuff you need to do in order to gain your salvation. It's work it out, throw it out, live it out. Um, I don't know whether you 
decided over the recent months to uh, create a home gym, uh, whether going to the gym was something that you liked doing anyway previously. Uh, but there, but workouts are things that we understand. You know, people go to a gym, they go and find some, uh, maybe go out running or they do some sort of exercises. And the intention is to work out, to, to exercise and use the muscles, the strength that they have to, to not only maintain it, but also in some way to increase it and grow it. And that's what Paul is calling them to do. He's saying you need to work out your salvation. You have salvation. You're to use it. You're to, to demonstrate it. And more than that, it's also to grow and to develop. The question, I guess, for us, though, is how are we, or even are we, conscious of our salvation, of our faith being worked out at present? Is your faith growing? Are you exercising it? Are you using it? Is it something that is a constant daily reliance? Uh, I guess um, usually if someone's been to the gym, they like to tell us about it, don't they? they? They might say, you know, the next day, oh, I'm really aching after my workout from yesterday. Well, I, I guess it's not particularly likely uh, that as Christians, we're going to go around saying, well, uh, you know, I read Ephesians chapter two uh, last night and my head is still throbbing uh, with the joys of uh, what I what I read there and my heart is still burning with the the love of the, the the work that God has done to brought me a wretched sinner to himself we, we don't tend to go around saying that neither do we tend to sort of go around talking to each other and saying well the Lord has recently been stripping away my reliance of self and and causing me to put further faith in him and, and that's been a painful process but I'm thankful for it. Or perhaps, you know, I've heard some, some bad news this week and I don't know how to respond, but I'm going to put my faith and my trust and my confidence still in God. But those are ways in which we work out our faith and we don't need to tell everybody about it, do we? Though perhaps sometimes that's helpful uh, and encouraging for one another. But those are practical ways in which our faith can be worked out, our salvation can be grown and added to in terms of our own uh, personal experience. And that, in some ways, is what Peter, I think, is referencing to uh, in, in the reading that we just had from 2 Peter chapter 1. You know, Peter there says, doesn't he, add to your faith. Well, how do we, how do we add to our faith? What he's meaning there is, isn't he, uh, like this, work it out, develop it, spend time thinking on it. He talks there, doesn't he, about love and fellowship and goodness and self-control and uh, bringing those to bear in our lives. Work them out, Paul says. But he calls it to be done seriously. Verse 13, again, Paul says, uh, sorry, verse uh, 12, end of verse 12, isn't it? Uh, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Uh, and he does quite literally mean fear and trembling here. The words used uh, are essentially terror and quaking um we're not necessarily words that we want to associate with our salvation are they uh, if paul had written here with joy and blessing uh, we would be quite comfortable with that fear and trembling though why well we need to remember that the matter of the gospel and the matter of christian living and walking worthy of it is a really serious affair. It's not something we can take lightly or be half-hearted about. It's something we have to be deliberate and purposeful over. Fear and trembling. We think, don't we, when we guess we use those words, we have to think back to the Old Testament where we have these pictures of the Israelites at uh, the bottom of Mount Sinai, uh, about to have the, the Lord giving them the, the Ten Commandments and the, the other elements of the law to be kept. And the Lord says, you, you can't come near that. There's to be a fear here. Or Moses with the burning bush. And God says to him, don't come any closer. Take your sandals off. You're standing on holy ground. There's this constant picture in the Old Testament, particularly when God gives his laws of sort of a fear and a trembling and a reverence and a care with how we approach God. 
And there's a seriousness to it, isn't there? God says, you need to treat, coming to me, living for me seriously. In fact, we see that especially in, in Leviticus, uh, Leviticus chapter 26. God there has, says to the people, I've given you my rules, my commands to follow and obey. If you follow them, here's a load of blessings I'll give to you. If you disobey them, here's a number of punishments and curses that will fall on you. God is serious about the way that his people act. He, he, he demands that we take it and consider living for him seriously. And the question is, has God changed? You know, since God gave those commandments, has he, has he altered? And since the cross and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, has God changed? No. Our view and our understanding of God has changed and hopefully grown and, and and developed as we read through the scriptures, as we see and experience his salvation personally for ourselves. And God is still the same God. We should be serious and careful about the way that we conduct our lives before him. Yes, we can boldly approach his throne. Yes, we are covered by grace. Yes, we are saved and secure for eternity but we're to be serious about how we live for him. Just briefly, if you're able to flip to uh, Hebrews and chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, uh, the writer here talks about the relationship and the way in which we should look at approaching God. Hebrews chapter 12 uh, and then verse 18. And he relates, you know, how we approach God back with the Old Testament accounts of the Israelites. Hebrews 12, verse 18. It says, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom and storm, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. But, verse 22, you have come to Mount Zion. To the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church, the firstborn, whose names were written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of righteousness made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than Abel. Then skip down to verse 28, where he says this, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. He says there, no, we, haven't, we don't have come in the same way as the Israelites did. We come through Jesus. But let's remember who our God is. Let's be serious about the way that we live for him and with him. And then Paul, again, in verse 14, who as he continues on this thought of, of serving, working out, our, working out our salvation, he says, do everything without grumbling or arguing. Well, that's uh, a challenge for all of us, isn't it, at times? <laughs> we all look at uh, various things and we all find it perhaps all too easy uh, to grumble about what is going on or what our experiences are. But how are we when it comes to the commands that God gives to us? For the things that God calls us to do. We grumble and argue about the way that God is calling us to live at the moment. We try and wriggle out and find loopholes and ways to get around what God has said we clearly shouldn't do, but yet we try to find ways to justify it. Or perhaps there's this. We don't necessarily gr sort of grumble and moan about things, but instead what we do, we play out in our heads what we might be able to do if we weren't Christians. For example, you know, maybe you're uh, single, you wish you were in a relationship and there's someone that you know, they're a good friend, you get on well with them, but they're not a Christian. And uh, you would love to, to enter into a relationship with them and you play out in your head all the time what would it be like if i did this oh, if only i wasn't as a christian then this would be able to take place 
or maybe there are other aspects and things we, we do that with as well. If I wasn't a Christian, I would be able to do this. We think it through. We need to be careful, need to be careful with that. With those, you know, that could still be sin. Entertaining and longing for something that God has said we shouldn't be doing. Grumbling against the commands that God has expressly given to us and wanting to try and push them and resist them, even within our hearts. Why is it, though, that Paul says that we should be working out our salvation? Well, as we're going to see, secondly, it is something that pleases God. The second second heading is that sanctification, as we're thinking about this morning, is not only an act of duty, but it is an act of beauty, an act of beauty. Now, there are some things, aren't there, <clears throat> that we see people doing, and, and we can appreciate the beauty of what they're doing. Uh, for example, maybe you're watching a, a bricklayer uh, so laying down a perfectly straight, beautifully crafted wall. We can appreciate, can't we, the skill that goes into that, or a carpenter. <laughs> excuse me um who, who takes a, a lump of wood and then crafts something incredible uh, out of it uh, a piece of furniture or maybe uh, something to, to decorate our homes uh, we find a beauty perhaps uh, for those of you who enjoy tennis watching roger federer's forehand cross court shots or uh, there's a beauty isn't there in seeing as well a little child going up to someone giving them a hug uh, without them asking or being encouraged to do so. It's just a pure act of, of love. And that's something that we enjoy seeing. There are actions that we as God people can carry out and, and do that God finds immensely pleasurable. And that is, as we, as you will have obviously picked up where we're we thinking about this morning, the, the times when we do things that are right in his sight. How do we know this? Well, just think back to Jesus's life. Jesus, isn't he, on when he's on the, the mount or, or when he's transfigured uh, before uh, Peter, James and John, when Moses and Elijah uh, come down and meet with him and talk with him as well. Uh, there's a voice from heaven. God himself speaks in Matthew chapter 17, verse seven. And God says, with him, I am well pleased. Why was the father pleased with the son? Well, it was because he had done everything in perfect love and obedience. Jesus was perfect, wasn't he? We, we know that we can trust our salvation upon it. And, and it's because of Jesus's perfectness that the father is pleased. In fact, isn't, it, that, isn't that what Paul has just been hinting at? In the preceding verses to the to our passage this morning, verse nine, Paul says in chapter two, verse nine, therefore God exalted him to the highest place. Why? Because he humbled himself, we're told in verse eight, by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. It was the obedience of Jesus that pleased the father and caused the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the case for us, too, isn't it? When God sees what we do, he is pleased. Verse 15, so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine like stars in the sky. Paul says you are to live lives worthy of the gospel. Because when you do, you will become more like the children of God that you're supposed to be. And what parent doesn't delight in seeing their child do things that are good and right? There are times, aren't there, as a parent, you, you, you ask your child to do something and you're just and you're thankful that, you, they, that they do the right thing. Perhaps you're just relieved as well, amongst other things, too. But you're pleased. And God, when he sees us acting Live, seeking to live out those blameless and pure lives, seeking to do what is good and right, is pleased. And pleased when he sees us bearing the hallmarks of what it means 
to be part of his family. When as his children, we do what is good and right in his sight. It's a challenge though, isn't it? Because Paul says there, that you might become pure and blameless children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. A reminder for us that every generation is actually warped and crooked. It wasn't unique for the people of the Philippi. It isn't unique for us in our day. It's always the challenge. The challenge is that we always have around about us people who bear the signs that they don't love God, but instead of pursuing not only their own hearts, but pursuing rebellion towards God all the time. That's a painful truth for us to remind ourselves of because we know the consequence of those actions is going to be the wrath and the punishment of God. But we're called to stand out. We're called not to be the same. We're called to look like God's children. And as we do so, he says, then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. It's a graphic picture, isn't it? Uh, recently, we've been encouraged haven't we, to look into the night sky and try and find, find and count the stars uh, in Orion's belt to try and understand how much light pollution there may be at, the, at present. Uh, well, when you if you ever if you do that at all, when you stare up into the night sky, uh, the longer you stare, uh, hopefully the brighter the stars look because your eyes adjust to it. Uh, but also it is just a staggeringly beautiful scene, isn't it? Seeing all these tiny little lights pricking out of the, the intense darkness that they're on. And there's an illustration that Ian used a while back. Uh, now, I think he said that he'd heard it from read it or read it from someone else. Uh, but it was, you know, as we enjoy seeing stars in the night sky, as God looks on the world, what does he see? He sees the sin and the blackness of this earth. And then amongst the sin and the blackness, what are God's people? Like these little pinpricks of stars. We are to be pleasing in the sight of God so that God, when God looked at this world, he can see this beauty of his people, of little glimpses of light, his stars, his children in a world that is otherwise dark and spoilt and stained. Doesn't that excite you? To think that as you live and seek to live a life that is pleasing and honouring to the Lord, that keeps in obedience with his word, we look pleasing and beautiful to God. If that doesn't motivate you or encourage you to, to want to obey God, uh, well, perhaps you don't necessarily love God in the first place. We should want to make our lives look pleasing to God. It's a sign, isn't it? If you love someone, uh, you want to do the things that please them. And that's exactly what God's commands are in the word before us. They are ways which we can please God, in which our lives look attractive to him. And therefore we should want to carry it out. But another reason is not only uh, that it looks just pleasing to God, but actually it shows the beauty and the power of salvation. Now, Paul again, doesn't he, he says in verse uh, 15 uh, that you then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firm to the word of life. He, he calls us to, to shine amongst people. Yes, we're seen by God, but it's to be seen by those around about us. It's a light that is to be visible among the people that we're living with. It's all to us, uh, what in remembrance, what Jesus says, uh, Matthew chapter five, Matthew chapter five, verse 14. Jesus says this in the Sermon on the, uh, in the, Sermon on the Mount, uh, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. As we live out what it means to truly love God, it's 
in by others. And somehow, in some way, <clears throat> they're going to give glory to God for it. We trust and hope that that will be that as they come to uh, salvation as well because of our witness. And how is all this achieved? How is it achieved that we can walk without grumbling, that we can be pure and blameless, that we can be stars in the sky? Well, the answer is there in verse 16, isn't it? As you hold firmly to the word of life. It's by holding on to this book that it's achieved. And that, so we'll briefly, very, very briefly, for time's sake, uh, just think about the third heading this morning, which would, which is uh, it's an act of authenticity. Act of authenticity. Paul almost makes a bit of a strange turn at the end of these verses, doesn't he? Uh, he, he then goes on to say, well, uh, you, you need to hold on to the word of life and uh, and then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labour in vain. Think, Hang on a second, Paul. You're wanting them to live in a right way so that you can boast? Is this right? Now, are you saying, Paul, that what you need is for them to live in, in, a, in a good way uh, so that you get some sort of glory? But it carries on, doesn't it? He says, but uh, that he, he he doesn't he knows that he hasn't laboured in vain. So Paul is saying, is Paul saying here? Well, I need to know that I've got it right. That my life's been really worth it, and I want you to be the the validation of my ministry by living correctly. Well, no. Paul didn't need <clears throat> the church in Philippi to obey. Uh, in order to make his ministry look valid. Uh, it didn't authenticate him as, as, a, as an apostle or it didn't add to his salvation in any way. Uh, Paul uh, writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, he says, you know, let one who boasts, boast in the Lord. He, he knew that everything he did was because for and of God. What Paul wants to be able to do is he wants to be able to rejoice. That's what the word boast there means, actually. He wants to be able to rejoice and glory in what God has done amongst the church and the people in Philippi, that he, by God's grace, was the means and the way to help bring that about. And I guess the, the question and the point for us to particularly think about for, from what Paul says here is just, do our lives bear testimony to the faithful ministry that we have heard here at Tollgate over the years? Do we bear testimony to the word of life that we've come to know and hold to and that we show out that it has truly impacted us? Because when we do, it's an act that shows that we are authentic Christians. That we've not only heard the real gospel, but that we've believed the real gospel and, and that we are resting in the real gospel. There is nothing else, is there, that changes people's lives like the power found in the gospel. Authentic Christianity uh, produces life changing responses and it's seen in the ever-increasing holiness of the Lord's people. We are to be sanctified. We are to have increasing holiness in our lives. Why? Because, yes, it's our duty. But more wonderful than that, it's appealing and pleasing to God. It bears testimony to the world. And it shows that our faith is genuine. It's not put on. So are we, by the Spirit's help, living worthy of the gospel with holy lives, beautiful to God, and as witnesses to the world. We're going to sing, uh, for those of us at home at least, our final hymn uh, this morning, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. It was the final verse that I had in mind as I picked this one. It's really uh, encapsulates some of the, a prayer for where we've been thinking this morning, where it, we re, where we're going to be seeing this. Finish then thy new creation, pure and spotless let us be. 
let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee, changed from glory into glory, till in heaven we take our place, till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love and praise. Let's sing, listen, hum uh, these along with this hymn as we worship our God together. <laughs> 